Well, well, Senator, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. I'm sorry that you can't join us uh, at our annual meeting, but uh, again, thank you for, for doing this today. So, Senator, I know you've been referred, uh, you've referred to yourself as a lifelong conservationist and that you're a, a big birding enthusiast. So yep. where do you think that interest in conservation comes from? So let, let's take the birding enthusiast first. I remember vividly as a fifth grader staring out my window, uh, didn't pay attention to uh, as much stuff as I probably should have in grade school and high school and had to do a little catching up towards the end of uh, secondary education. And then in college, I had to do it for real, but I always loved the outdoors. And I noticed a bunch of birds flying around on the neighboring property and they were flying into a large birdhouse and that caught my attention. It was a purple martin that is the largest of the swallow family. And uh, it was like something clicked. So I asked my dad to build a birdhouse. And of course he wasn't a carpenter. So I think he worked at a furniture factory and had someone do that. And I put up that birdhouse in 1964 and uh, had Martins that first year and have been a landlord for Purple Martins, uh, you know, now for um, 57 years, I guess. So, uh, and I love it. They come faithfully back every spring and they dutifully winter in the Amazon and we only have them for about four months. And then all other uh, birds as well as outdoor and nature appealed to me. Moved back in 78 after we lived away for two years in Boston and wife and I made the smartest decision together, uh, I guess outside of deciding to marry one another, was to move back to our hometown. And I wanted to live in the country, bought 100 acres, got me interested in silviculture, uh, actively manage woodland uh, for many, many years and still do. And it's good therapy for my new job. Sure. Um, so, Senator, your professional background prior to being elected to the Senate includes founding Crystal Farms, a turkey farm. So. Yep. That experience shaped your view of the uh, connections between agriculture and conservation. Well, that was my uh, second entrepreneurial endeavor. And once we got it off the ground, it was right at the time when uh, livestock and poultry were starting to be raised in ways other than kind of roaming the pasture or the barnyard. And uh, it was a big deal uh, because you had to keep your facilities clean. Uh, you had to take the manure and litter out and it was at the early stages of where you could have done that responsibly or maybe irresponsibly and we always tried to do that before indiana department of environmental management had kind of strict guidelines and that made me aware that even in farming you know we're the breadbasket of the world we do so well with productivity it generates a lot of waste and uh, you got to be careful so it doesn't end up in your streams and uh, you know have that unintended consequence so respected it we're careful with it and that was kind of my first realization of responsibility with having a business and the environment so senator you went on to own and operate meyer distributing an auto parts distribution company with global headquarters in jasper indiana and meyer logistics so tell us a bit about that company and, and the work they do well, that sounds like a glorified name and function currently. So let me tell you how it started. It was uh, myself and about 14 others in a company that was struggling in 81, selling mostly to farmers. That was the year of the farm crisis. Mm -hmm. So I'm highly credentialed out of a business school where I didn't hardly need any of that education. I needed my wits uh, to survive. and we started doing something different than what the business was doing. Got the original business back on its feet, but I needed to deliver products instead of manufacturing and installing stuff. So I literally pulled the painter out of the paint shop. He was my first driver and believe it or not, still driving for us. And so I had to manage vehicles and most of them were used, uh, not the best equipment we had to make do and we always tried to keep them in good repair. I was always conscious of miles per gallon along with functionality. And then had another way that I could kind of impact environment uh, by running a logistics company 
in a responsible way. And a lot of that is now just coming to fruition in terms of what transportation can do to put less CO2 into the air. Oh, sure. So uh, again, just kind of expanding on that, running an auto parts uh, distribution company and logistics company, you know all, all, about all the needs and demands uh, in the transportation sector, including access to reliable, affordable, clean fuel sources. So how are your companies involved in these efforts now? So that from those humble beginnings for 17 years with basically, I think we had four or five trucks after that. We've now got 70 locations in 40 states and over 400 truck drivers. And we always look at the state of the art of the equipment and generally are not uh, making an issue out of having vehicles that are emitting fewer effluents and, uh, you know, greenhouse gases. So we try to be everything in good shape there. Uh, I embrace the cleanest, least expensive fuel into the future. I believe there is an external cost to particulate uh, pollution and greenhouse gas uh, issues. So uh, I'm glad to see that we're making a move to take that seriously. I know that we haven't felt a lot of current consequences, but I do accept the science and as a steward of the land and a steward of my business, try to do, make all the decisions I can to at least uh, practice what I preach. So how did the idea for the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus come about? So that had come up several years before I arrived here. It's just that on my side of the aisle, uh, as, as a conservative and one of the most fiscally conservative in the Senate, I don't think you can be the party of no, or I'm not interested. Uh, that is the way I think you get a lot of misguided legislation, largely driven through big government that we're not paying for all of it currently and even wanna do more of it. But for conservatives, that needs to be a lesson that that is what you're gonna get if you refuse to engage in like how to fix the healthcare system, my number one priority. That's like pulling teeth to get them to realize that they need to embrace competition, transparency. Fix my own healthcare system to make it consumer driven 13 years ago and make sure you avoid the system through wellness. Haven't had a premium increase in 13 years. It's another subject for another time. I take that same point of view on what we can do through the climate caucus. And that what I'm seeing there is transportation, electric generation, industrial emitters, and especially agriculture, they're right on the front lines of what climate's doing to their business, want to be part of the solution, uh, not to dig in to preserve the status quo. That's refreshing. That's why we got a bill passed on a difficult subject, 92 to eight, believe it or not, on climate matching up good stewardship with existing markets. Nobody thought that could be done. I'm a entrepreneur off the street, and now I guess maybe a little bit of a political entrepreneur, and I'm trying to use that same kind of energy and knowledge and know how to get things done. So you're also a big supporter of tree planting for carbon offsets. So can you talk a little bit about that? There's probably not anything that we've done as a world that's been more counter to uh, having less CO2 in the air, and that's deforestation. And sadly, we're seeing it in many places that are trying to get some agricultural independence. You know, in the Amazon, for instance, that's kind of considered the, the lungs of the world. And I don't know how many acres we're deforesting in a given year, but it is a lot. And sadly, that won't probably go back to trees. And trees are the best carbon sink. And if you manage them well, to where you promote robust, well-managed growth, you produce a lot of uh, carbon capture within the product. And as long as you don't burn it and you use it, it's got a real dual purpose, uh, absorbing CO2 and then retaining it if you use it as a building material. But if you're cutting it down, converting it to pasture, especially uh, because probably certain farms of livestock would emit more CO2 per acre than anything and other uh, greenhouse gases. 
it's counterproductive. The more we can keep it in trees to begin with, and then where we have cleared, where it was unwise to do it, replant. So what's the one thing you want people to know about your conservation efforts, particularly here in Indiana? I think the one thing I'd want them to know about me in general, when it comes to being different from almost any senator here, and I've been in the trenches in the real world, living conservation through my interests early on, and especially once whatever uh, spark got uh, lit, you know, becoming a tree farmer. Um, and when it comes to building a business, I look at it because most everything I've learned is by doing something and, you know, having consequences that if you make poor decisions in the short run, you're going to definitely pay the price in the long run. And I see what we do through the federal government here. So many people look to it as kind of the savior of last resort. And the reason I ran is because it looked like we we're driving this institution into the ditch, you know, by the way we manage it, which is not really with many people that even have run a lemonade stand, let alone, you know, an enterprise. And that's really what we're in need of. It doesn't take more career politicians. Uh, it doesn't take more lawyers. I almost became one myself. I always got to be careful there. That's where I was headed before I went to business school. But the kind of individual that wants to get into government and make a career out of it, they're missing all the real world experience that I think this place needs a good dose of. Well, Senator, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, keep up the good work. And again, I, I apologize that uh, uh, we weren't able to uh, have you at our annual meeting and um, um, best wishes to you and your staff and, and keep up the good work, sir. And uh, thank you for doing this. And maybe we can have the uh, in-person uh, uh, address and discussion uh, somewhere down the road. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. See you.